friends and fellow citizens. Tuesday's National Day rally symbolized or summarized the stage that we have reached in Singapore. It was colorful, it was moving, and it was choreographed for TV. It's part of the new age. It's meant not just for the 60,000 there, but for the one and a half million or two million watching. It's a symbolic day for us. It summarizes progress or retrogression year by year. These, the first few years, or well, the first 15 years really, the emphasis was on survival. Can we survive? Nobody assumes that's a problem now. In 1965, all the Wise Acres put a big question mark against Singapore. A British base, island, former colony. How will it survive without a hinterland? You know, in 19, these are landmarks in my mind, a sort of a little nick cut in my brain. 1969, there were riots in Kuala Lumpur, May the 13th. And there was a little unease that, you know, wild men may decide to reverse the Tunku's decision to get us out of Singapore. So, 69. August the 9th, we thought better produce the tanks. We had been buying tanks, second-hand tanks, AMX-13. So we thought better produce them in case. And it had a certain calming effect on the population of Singapore. They said, oh, well, that's all right then. The British, you know, were leaving in 1971. So we pushed hard. We had to have an Air Force. So 1971, first hunters, Hawker hunters, flew at the parade. 82, we went into supersonics, F5Es. 87, we have Hawkeye. But now it's because it is all right. Therefore, we say there's no need for it. So we just have none. We just have a few helicopters to take the flag across the stadium. That is the kind of situation we have to work towards. So we move towards more spectator participation, national songs, community singing, a celebratory festival air, which is right. But remember, this is Southeast Asia and storm clouds can gather very suddenly. So, please have umbrellas ready. <laughs> there was a sense of well-being, a sense of achievement on Tuesday night. But it's not just the show, you know. It's not just getting people into the stadium and having rehearsed it, is actual life experiences before 
Malays, Indians, Chinese, Eurasians, others will sing. This is my country, this is my flag, and not feel cynical and think this is all imposition and hypocrisy. They must believe that this is their country. If you squeeze them, it cannot be. It's because their life experience, what they experience in school, their workplace, their homes, their neighbours, they say, yes, this is right. I've been around to some community centres and it's fulfilled a certain emotional need. Partly because we are now moving towards one language. We all understand English, more or less. And Chinese singing Indian songs no longer look absurd. <laughs> it's become part of the landscape, which, I, which is a good thing. But I want to add a word of caution. In an upswing, when things are getting better, better jobs, better homes, better clothes, from buses to MRT, to better buses, it's easy. Because there's more to share. More slices, bigger slices of the cake. When things go down, There's competition. It is not easy. Remember, to build a nation is not to build a modern high-rise. It's like building the pyramids. It's not something that can be done overnight. Yes, we took 30 years to be able to have that kind of us. A feeling of being one community on Tuesday night. But this is my nation, but a fragile one. Don't put it under too much stress. What makes a nation succeed, makes it prosperous, is wealth and strength, is progress, is advancement, is achievement depends first and foremost upon the quality of its people. Next, the quality of its leaders. Next, the natural resources of the territory which the tribe or the nation has. And the cohesiveness of the group that's able to make the best out of that territory. The level of education it achieves, the level of technology, the capital equipment it has, its infrastructure. How did we get here? I've been at this job 30 years. I did not do a course in government, but if I did not learn and argue and read and talk and analyze and get to the basics, we wouldn't have got here. We had a group of men who were committed to getting things done because we believed we had assumed that responsibility and if we didn't discharge it, calamity will be our responsibility. Well, first of all, we were lucky. We had an energetic people, high learning speed. They had stamina. They had endurance. They had a high threshold for pain. And their Asian cultures put society above self, above the individual. 
But there was one other imponderable which we had, intangible. Without Malaysia, those two years, we could not have made it. Because the place was too fractious, too quarrelsome, the communists were too powerful, too many strikes, too many troubles. Two years in Malaysia taught everybody a real lesson. That if we want to survive, we submerge our differences and get going. So after separation, strikes went down, Chinese chauvinism declined, less trouble. We got the economy going. And the first thing we insisted upon was honest, efficient government, which means honest, effective ministers, because without that you can't have honest, efficient civil servants. Just not possible. And to have honest, efficient ministers, you must have honest MPs. People who can mobilize, inspire their constituents, their people, as worthy of trust and leadership. In other words, dedicated men. You know, if we had an opposition that's also like us, honest, dedicated, efficient. We can argue, we can disagree, but either way it goes, it's safe. The country will not fall apart. But when that is not the case, and that has never been the case in my 30 years of active life in politics, we have to be extremely careful because one toss of the coin, it comes out tails, is finished. One five-year term and it's finished. <clears throat> Let me explain why I think the electorate, and I hope the younger people are listening to me, you cannot have double standards. If you expect good government, Efficient government, honest government, and you expect that of PAP MPs, you must put the same yardstick against the opposition. Or you are inviting trouble. Or you are putting it on the PAP to keep on exposing and de debunking. And if you elect such a person, you are sending a signal that we don't mind a dishonest chap so long as he can create pressure and mischief and all is well. That's not a very good trend. We have been able to, re to self-renew with people in the 1980s. People who go in and suffer Losses as a result, but feel it is a public duty. I give you the doctors. Dr. Dixie Tan, Dr. Arthur Bing, Dr. Ong Ch uh, Tan Ching Bok, Dr. Ko Lam San. Before they even became MPs, I asked them, are you sure you want to do this? Because it takes time. That means less time for your practice. And they are all in private practice. It means money. And going to the constituency and running around is not money. It's loss of money. There are problems. Each one is a sacrifice. A real sacrifice because it means loss of personal 
contact. And a doctor is very much like a dentist, very personal relationship. And I have to see some of them. Like I saw Dixie Tan the other day. I said, why not stand again? Because it hurt her practice more than she thought it would. Just call it a day. Go back. She's not going to be a minister. She's not going to have fame and glory. She's just looking after one constituency. But it is important. In a crisis, you are one out of 79 votes. As a citizen, you are one out of 1.3 million votes. That's the difference. And you've got to have good men. You take the lecturers, Dr. Aileen Wong, Dr. Ong, Ao Chin Ha. Constituency work means less research work. Less research papers published means less promotion prospects. <laughs> this, is, this is Singapore. The Senate is not interested whether you're an MP or not. The Senate of the University. Where, where are your papers? You've read about uh, Brigadier General Yeo, George Yeo. I don't know. I mean, he might, if he had known this at the beginning, he might have thought otherwise. <laughs> he has had to pay $60,000 in liquidated damages for resigning before his bond is complete. And he's lost $80,000 of his pension, which could have been converted into CPF because he's not allowed to retire in the public interest. He's retiring because he wants to go into politics. That's $143,000. Right? So, you don't make such decisions lightly. You read Nasser Kamaruddin, the SBC announcer. I don't, he, he's leaving and he's going to pay $8,000 because he's not completed his bond. Let me explain how it could be otherwise. And once it is otherwise, it's very difficult. Once money is the motivation, then you can say anything to please the electorate. You get in, you clean up. You have read today's newspapers, Pre Vice President Laurel accuses Mrs. Aquino of corruption in the bureaucracy. Resign, says he. Incompetent corruption. Well, but there is no hint that Mrs. Aquino is corrupt, which is a great help. But the people she appointed, also in, in today's straight Sunday Times, the presidential Commission for Good Government, PCGG. They are supposed to trace and chase and get all the assets which the Marcos crowd, Marcos and his cronies had run away with. Get the money back, charge them. They have now got hold of some of the properties and they are hanging on to it. I mean, this is a... So quick, once it gets endemic like that, that's a very big trouble.
you need more than Mrs. Aquino to clean it up. How to clean up? You put one dollar in, rev expenditure budget one dollar. As it goes down the tube, it siphon off, lucky you get 20 cents reaching the ground. China under the KMT in the last stages was such a mess. So the communists came in, clean, dedicated, eager beavers. And Hao Yun Chong told me that his sister, who was in the village in Maysian, very impressed when they first came in, they helped to repair your houses, they helped to harvest your crops, etc. <laughs> now, after 40 years, not quite 40 years, next year will be 40 years of communist rule, corruption is a problem. Very serious problem. What's the lesson for us? Keep it clean. Keep it honest. It is an absolute asset. It can go away very easily. It can be lost very easily. In two, three years. I think you've got to be realistic. Get honest men. Pay them adequately as near market rates what they are earning as possible. Tony Tan has given up a job which could have got him half a million a year by now in the bank. I made discreet inquiries. Who's paid what? Right? Why should he be doing this? For 200,000 a year? Why should Ong Ting Chung be doing this since 1970? He was an MP in 72. I think he became minister in 75. Why should he be doing this? There has been a, a construction boom and architects make in the hundreds of thousands, if not in the millions. Why should Richard Hu give up his job in the MAS? We have moved into different times and we've got to keep the system practical and viable. But you've got to keep it clean. What is the sum involved to pay the market rate? Piffle. The whole cabinet, the whole government, less than 15 million a year. You underpay. You want to make a show of it. They do this in America. And you see what happens. But besides honest government, you've got to have other things too. Industrial peace, good industrial relations, which is what we have achieved. But it needs tending, nurturing. You need to concentrate on education, training, You need a cooperative environment both internally and in the region with our neighbors in ASEAN. When I went down to the National Day Parade reception after the parade, the Israeli ambassador, Israel Eliashiv, came up to me and congratulated me. This marvelous place. Good parade, marvelous place, Singapore. I was here in 1969, he says. He was talking of the time and he sat down next to me and how we discussed these things and the other. He meant it. So I said to him, We are at peace, you are at war. 
if you make peace, you settle peace with the Arabs, West Bank and Gaza Strip, she will be immensely better than we are. Such talented people with seven, eight hundred percent inflation at one time just a few years ago. So there's a lesson here. Yes, we learned from them how to use a civilian population totally for total defense. But we also use our own common sense. Do we need constant warring? Absolutely not. Do we need a strong defense? Absolutely yes. Then you have no constant warring. So when I said to him, look, settle West Bank and Gaza, he said, but you know the PLO is out to destroy Israel. I said, yes, yes, I, I've heard the whole argument. I've read long articles on it. There are books written on the matter. It's so complex. It goes back so long. It's sometime, someplace, somebody's got to say, look, this is not worth it. Let's take a risk at peace. Because the other way is to risk another war. But that's the way life is. I've watched Lieutenant General Winston Chu since he was, I think, a captain, major, ADC to Yang Dipatran Nagara, Che Yusuf Isha. And he's grown more and more soldier-like with the years. He looks superb on National Day. I congratulated the Minister of Defence. It is important. You know all these beautiful sashes he wears, all these huge medals? They're not Singaporean ones, you know. Each of the countries that are important to us, he's got a big gong from, which is a very good Achievement. They like him. He represents the SAF. They have no doubt as to his good and honorable intentions, and they trust him. I think that's a plus. So not only must a Singapore commander know his job, he's also got to know his job as a soldier, he's also got to know his job as a good Southeast Asian citizen. <clears throat> I want now to take three examples of where we have made progress because we took tough decisions on very sensitive and spiky, difficult issues. But they were right decisions, so we have progress. First, you know, the, I showed it just now in, China, in the Chinese, the decline in birth rates. I'll go through it quickly. Can I have chart one? You see how we have improved 19% birth increase in 88 against 87 87, we had 6% increase over 86, which registered a minus 8%. Now, chart two. This gives the different ethnic figures. Dragon year, 22% for Chinese. Last year, no, 86, I think, was tiger year. Minus 11. You look at the Malays, they were not bothered about Tiger Year. They had a plus 2. <laughs> and this is not a Dragon Year for them. They had plus 11. <laughs> the Indians had minus 6 in Tiger Year, minus 6%, but this year they did plus 15. 
chart 3. This gives us a simple picture of whether we are reproducing ourselves. How many children does one woman produce? The green is for Malays. They are producing 2.3. That means more than replacing themselves. The Indians, the yellow, 2.1, which is just replacing themselves. The Chinese, 1.8, not reproducing themselves. <laughs> Chart 4. This gives, a reason, gives one reason why the birth rates are as they are. It shows how many have third and fourth child? Malays, 19%, 11%. 19% child, 11% fourth child. Indians, less, 17, third child, 5, fourth child. Chinese, 39, sorry, 15, third child, 3, fourth child. Now, this is a worrying reflection of what takes place because the chances are, if you go into multiples of four and beyond, that means you are not working. Working women do not have such high order births. Five, chart five. This gives the reason why the breakdown is as it is. Age of marriage, <coughs> the Malays about three years younger than the others. Now, it does not really represent the true position because I think Indians marry slightly younger than Chinese, but we've had to join the two because the registry of marriages does not break them up. So if you break them into Malays, Chinese, Indians, the picture will be grimmer. Chart 5A, this shows mean age of first baby. And if you look at it, you see Malay is at 24.7, Indians 26, Chinese 27.8. You start later, you have less, that's troublesome. But because we were prepared to take this out into the open, The issue was raised. It's spiky, it's uncomfortable, it's sensitive. But we are getting comprehension in the population. They know this is not a, it's not a funny joke. It has long-term implications and it's turning around. And I hope next year, although it's no more dragon year, we are not going to go back into minus Next, the singles problem. Can I have chart six? This is the social development unit. It started in 84. You remember the issue was first raised. Membership 1,395, no marriages. 85, it had increased some marriage, 86, 87, 88. 516 marriages and nearly 7,000 participating. But it's more than that. It shows that people understand this is not embarrassing, 
This is not a slight on them as individuals. It is a whole group of people trapped by too rapid a transformation of our society. Educated women, educated men in equal numbers in each category. The men still stuck with ancient customs and culture and marrying down. And it's not just the graduates. The worst of are the A-level girls. Can I have seven? You see? More girls involved. Total number of A-levels, 84,000 unmarried. And only 5,000 are inside the program. And because it's just started, very few marriages. Chart 8, this is O level. But they are not so much of a problem. This is new. The marriage rates are low, but I will show you a table later which will show why it's not a problem. The O level girl, the supply is less than the demand. <laughs> Nine, please. Now you watch this marriage pattern. This is for grooms, tertiary. Right? Here they marry downwards, lower. Here they marry their equals. Now you see the progress we have made. In 1983, which is the blue one, 37% of graduates married graduate girls. In 1988, this is the yellow one, 52%. In other words, a 15% increase in five years. 3% a year. Very slow, very painful, <laughs> but progress. Right? Now, in the same way, from marrying down 63% looking for brides who are not graduates, now 48%. Okay? A levels, same. 29% in 83, now 35%. O levels, 57% married their equals. Now, 59. Primary and others, 84 married equals, now 70. So, there's a slight movement up all along the way which will help solve this problem. Can I have 10? Chart 10. Uh, this gives... A very chilling picture. I'll explain it simply. On the left side, this column, is males minus females of all those who are single. Right? Your tertiary, A, O, primary. Of all those who are singles. Now, here you have minus means, that means more girls in tertiary. This is discovered by a survey. So you have more girls than men. A levels, you have more men than girls, more men than girls, but you look at primary. Very many more men than girls. Because many men can't find wives at all. All the primary girls have been taken up. O-level boy marries primary girl. Primary boy got nobody to marry. <laughs> See? Look at that. You look at this one. University A, O, and you look at this. There's one little comment I want to read from Dr. Eileen Au. I asked her whether she sent me this report. I said, would you mind if I read it? She said, no, go ahead. This is her task. She said, it's improving, it's 
people are aware, widespread support, private, uh, the private sector, the firms are doing it on their own, recreational clubs and so on. And uh, it's being decentralized, the statutory boards are also doing it on their own. But she added, task ahead is that of reconciling the expectations of the men and women with respect to their life partners. Reconciling the expectation of men and women with respect to their life partners. It comes down to rationalizing their fantasies with realism. <laughs> so she gets a long list of all the desirable things a girl wants in her husband. He must be good. He must not drink. He must not smoke. <laughs> <coughs> he must be kind and so on and so forth. There aren't such people to be found because they go through the forms of the men. They say, not there. So the men put their hopes of the girls they want to marry. She must be young. The man is 38. He wants to marry a girl who's 25. <laughs> she must be friendly, smiling, cheerful disposition, and so on. You run through the women's list. They are not there. <laughs> Let's settle for what we are. You look at your brother, look at your cousins, that's what's on the market. <laughs> if you go by SBC drama, <laughs> you're in trouble. <laughs> You'll spend the rest of your life looking for a dream husband who isn't there and for a girl that does not exist except with very careful makeup. <laughs> now let me explain why I think we ought to gradually shift up those numbers. Because if we look at our achievement in education, you will know why we have succeeded. Can I have chart 11? You look at the progress. 1978, the year before Dr. Go Keng Sui took over education and revamped it. Lots of caustic comments made, but you look at the results. 78, 79% passed PSLE. 87, 92%. All levels from 27% now double to 54%. A levels from 9% more than double to 22%. How did we do it? First, learning at the same speed. In other words, the teacher must be talking to a class that's going at the same pace. Call it what you like. But it's not wrong to stream. If you can't go at an express speed, go at a normal speed. If you can't go at a normal speed, go slightly slower, but you will make it. The dropout rate has gone down. Then we have had better teachers, more graduates, more A-levels, more graduates for secondary schools, more A-levels for primary schools. And we've got video, audio, computers, better school premises. Now, chart 12, university places. You look at the figures. <clears throat> 78, 2002. 4% of the cohort. Of the cohort means 12 years ago they entered primary school. They finished A-levels and they are in university. 
In 10 years to 88, we have gone up to 5,005, 5, nearly 5,006, to 13%. Three times the cohort, more than three times the cohort, nearly two and a half times in numbers. You can't fault the Minister for Education for not providing places. Now, I'll tell you the complaint why parents think we should have more places. Because they have been able to get into some British universities. Why? Because there are compelling money reasons for the British universities to take in overseas students. They are short of money. Next question is, having reduced admission standards, do they reduce graduation standards? If they do, which is possible, if they don't, then the supply will dry up because you know you can get in, you fail two, three times, and you have to get out. Then people hear about that and no more join. But if you do get a degree, that means we will have to start re-examining students or graduates from those universities. That's the only answer. <clears throat> but in any case, the Minister, Dr. Tony Tan, has prepared more places in the university uh, in Two years, three years, 1991, NTI will become a full university with another two to three thousand places extra. But that doesn't mean we lower our admission standards. We will have the places, but if you don't have those standards, you want to go to a substandard degree course elsewhere, that is another matter. Can I take uh, the next chart, 13? <clears throat> this is our equally important segment of our educational system. VITB, you see, is going up. Poly, from 28 to 76. And EDB, seven institutes, Japanese, German, French, Tata, Brown, Boveri, and seven of them all together, 1,008. If we are going to make it into the next stage, we must have more of these people. Everybody has to be trained for the job he's going to do. You can't just go in with uh, general education. Chart 14. This is just a, an update of how we have progressed since 84. Homeowners from 72% now to 81%. Chart 15. This is by households, three rooms, four rooms, five rooms. You will see the quality. How the four rooms are increasing. That's why Nisun has got so many three rooms untaken. HDB did not anticipate that people incomes would go up and they would aspire to four rooms. And so they overbuilt three rooms. And four rooms and five rooms will go up. Chart 16. <clears throat> this is how much we have gone up by in spite of a lower CPF. This is the total in the bank. 31 billion as against 23 billion four years ago. And per account holder from 12,000 to 15,000. Every account holder is $3,000 more after paying for all installments. Chart 17. This is all wage earners' incomes divided by the number of wage earners. 84 over 80, 38% increase. 88 over 84, 12%. 
There's a lesson there. It's because in 85 and 86, we had two bad years. 85, you will remember, nearly minus two. 86, a very weak recovery. So two years got wiped off. I think the lesson is, when we are doing well, don't push it to the limit. If we did not have the recession, we would have made more than 12%. But now that we are back on course, I recommend don't push it to the limit. Because if something goes wrong with uh, the American economy or demand in uh, Japan and uh, America next year or year after, we'll have another unpleasant adjustment. Just leave something in reserve, leave it in the flexi part, in the year-end variable. I now want to go on to a rather important part of our lives, this transformation in the nature of our society. Now, one reason why we are successful is because of the flexibility of the software, the culture, it's good to recognize that we are becoming, each one of us is more or less bicultural. As we are more or less bilingual. Now, it doesn't mean that if you are bilingual, you are bicultural. Because you can speak ten languages and just have one set of value culture, the one that you are born with. But by and large, you tend to be influenced by the language that you are talking in and reading in and using. What does it mean? You have two languages, yes, but there are two separate languages. You can't mix Chinese and English. There are two different languages. Some people do as they talk. Some of my Chinese educated MPs, sometimes they throw in an English word when they talk Chinese to me. But in the culture, you cannot. You, your value shifts. You cannot have two measuring sets. And the, common, the more common is the person who combines traits of two different cultures. That's the Singaporean. You can speak Mandarin. You go to China, they know you're not Chinese. You are a Singaporeanized Chinese. You have taken in a lot of Western influence and also Southeast Asian influence. And you are most just at home with those who share that background. But the key point to remember is that point between East and West, between Chinese and American or British values or Southeast Asian values differs with each individual. The more Chinese educated you are, generally speaking, the more Chinese in your culture values. But it need not necessarily be so. It depends a lot on the uh, considerably on the home influence. <coughs> we suffer from a serious hazard, which the Je Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Korea do, do not. In Hong Kong, the British Western influence is superficial. Yeah, yeah, the top people know English and they speak English. But it is a Chinese-speaking, Cantonese-speaking, Chinese value society. Deep. Everybody speaks Cantonese. They are at home in Cantonese. You watch the television. You watch the newspapers. 90% of their television time is in, in, in Cantonese. Their newspapers, the English newspapers, cater to the foreigners and a sprinkling of Hong Kong Chinese. The bulk of it are Chinese newspapers. 
So there is no danger of being overwhelmed, of having your original culture displaced. Our danger is that we've got so much of EL1, books, newspapers, magazines, TV, that we could become a pseudo-Western society. Not a real Western society. If you're a real Western society, that's another matter. But you become a pseudo-Western society, a fake one. <laughs> that's a disaster. The antidote is very important. The problem is with the upper crust. Many people believe, those who read the English newspapers and especially the foreign publications, you know, the offshore press, that that segment at the top represents Singapore. It does not. There's the lower down you go from the overseas educated to the Singapore educated to the Chinese educated to the Malay educated and even now to the English educated but who are basically Chinese, Malay and Tamil in their attitudes at home the less are these values accepted. So regardless of the language and the sentiments in the newspapers, there is the ground undertow of your society. And it is our business to keep that undertow Asian. And therefore, we have to preserve our society from being transformed. And when you have this offshore press trying to set the pace, we say, off with thee, this is my society. You're not reporting me to your audience in America or Britain or Australia. You're reporting me to me. You're influencing attitudes. Americans consider all political leaders potential crooks and criminals. No, they start off. You are elected, dangerous man, likely to be dishonest crook. Find more about him. And they write in derogatory terms. That's not acceptable in Asia. When people are elected to office here, they are respected. They are not held in contempt. I give an illustration of the difference over the arrest of the Marxist last year and the re-arrest this year. If you read the Western press, it's a tremendous event. The government was about to collapse. Every day, hordes of denunciatory telegrams. We are showered. We are under siege. That's rubbish, isn't it? This government was never threatened. At the very height of the controversy, we could take a vote and win comfortably. And indeed, with straw polling, we knew exactly what the ground was. Because there is a deep subterranean Asian set of values. And why this fuss? Because for the first time, an English educated group was involved in a law, the ISA, which hitherto had always been used against Chinese educated or Malay educated extremists and so on. Well, but there are no more Chinese educated Marxists. They have all become English educated, but that doesn't mean they have ceased to become ideologically radicals or Marxists. It is the tenderness of the English educated
to the English educated. They just find it difficult to reconcile themselves. For the English educated, let me explain. We accept differences of views and opinions as part of a way of life. It's natural in any society. It's completely open to anybody to take a contrary view, but not to manipulate other organizations or groups of persons. Take a position, but be prepared to have your position demolished or debunked, because that's part of democracy. If you tell me that my newspaper and printing presses act is undemocratic and so on, I say, right, let's argue this one out. I was prepared to go to Washington, as I did in April, and met 500 American editors. And I want to... Sh I have yet to hear one of them, including the Asian Wall Street Journal man who was the chairman of that conference, to point out where my position was false, illogical, or undemocratic. They cannot fault me. This is my country. This is my society. You point out where you have the right to interfere in my domestic politics. You attack, I am prepared to defend. I am wrong, I am demolished before the people. And remember, we give everybody full television time. The opposition, whether it's Cham Si Tong or Mr. Jai Ratnam, he had full television time. There was no censoring, there was no doctrine. The Law Society attacked us, I brought them to meet me face to face. Full television coverage. If Francis Xiao can get the better of me, let him. More encounters over more issues, so be it. Successively, people must know, isn't it? Who was right, who was wrong. Some young professionals reported to the MPs who reported to me, says, we lost. I don't think so. Or oh, I lost. I lost because he was bold enough, under questioning, to reply brazenly, one, that he was not under a cloud when he resigned from the, civil, from the legal service, and two, yes, that I had offered him a judgeship. Am I out of my mind? I mean, it sounds, it's good television, mind you. But anybody who knows me will know that that's the last thing I would do, isn't it? And I say this without the privilege of parliament. That I must have been out of my mind if I did that, and I never did it. So in other words, dishonesty, boldness, brazenness on television is good watching. All right, for once, for the first occasion. The second, the third, the fourth, the fifth. After a while, Mr. Jayaratnam was sounding very thin, wasn't it? Judicial interference, executive interference with the judiciary. So he pressed on. But that is democracy. If it was true, I am demolished. The government is destroyed. Its credibility is standing. We gave everybody a chance to have a go. Anybody can set up his party newspaper, publish it, hold public rallies, distribute pamphlets, go around the markets, shake hands, give pamphlets out, sell their newspapers, hold press conferences. Perfectly open. But it's not caught fire, isn't it? That's the way the PAP did it. The press was against us when we were formed in 84, uh, 54. We put out pamphlets. We sold them. The task ahead in 1959 is now a, 
a set of historic documents because we have fulfilled most of what we promised in education, labor, women's rights. So my invitation to those who feel that all this is uh, stifling is, look, stand up and be counted. I have no sympathy for people who say, look, oh, then they'll poke fun at me. Are you so fragile that you can't stand a little criticism? In order that we have the right to say what was going to happen to Singapore, my colleagues and I, Ko King Sri, Raja Ratnam, Do Chin Chai, Ong Pang Boon, we put our lives at stake. Our lives and liberty were at stake. So, I have no sympathy for people to say, look, I'm embarrassed. Let me... add this backdrop. We are not in the Caribbean. We are not in the Mediterranean. We are in Southeast Asia and subversion is endemic. Yes, the communist ideology is debunked. It was debunked the day the Chinese Daily, Ranmin Zhipao started using Singapore as a model for tourism, for public housing, for greening the city. I thought to myself, what a st strange world. All those disciples, the little mouse who made our lives a misery and made my life a misery, and they were deported in the 1950s and 60s, were now writing me Christmas cards and New Year cards. <laughs> <laughs> Praising Singapore when they were denouncing me as a lackey of the British imperialists. Why? Because they read it in Renmin Jipao. Since Renmin Jipao says so, it must be so. Of course, they also hope that, you know, perhaps their reapplication for <laughs> permanent residence may be considered. as an ideology that is gone, yes. But the people who have survived that revolution, who have developed the techniques of subversion, they are not going to give up. Chia Tai Po is not going to give up. Because if he gives up, his life's investment is written off. They are still plugging away. There are a few thousands of them in Malaysia and in Singapore, but more in Malaysia where the chances of revival, they believe, are greater because of ethnic, religious, and economic differences. So, remember this. If it ever restarts in Malaysia, and it's got an offshoot line, it's got a branch line in Singapore, then we are involved a second time. I don't know whether it's going to restart in Malaysia or not, but I know that for every Fuemso returnee in Singapore, there are three or four in Malaysia, like William Yap and Kenneth Tsang. More went back there. Some have been picked up, but many are still working, just as script writers, whatever. And there, the situation is different you can get a united front more easily revived. That's their business. But if we have a branch of that united front here, we are re-involved in another row. Another messy business. And I see no reason why we should allow it. Keep it clean. If it happens there, well, it's bad luck for us too, because don't believe we'll, we can have 
trouble there without some deleterious effects on us. But if there is no branch of the CUF here, there will not be that same friction. And there was no clash with the Catholic Church because otherwise they would not have sent us the third party note. In June, I just want to make brief comments on two items. One is the elected president. The other is town councils. The arguments I read in the newspapers and watched on television and heard in Parliament does not meet one simple point. The fact that we have not had profligate spending does not mean we will not have. Just put this out of harm's way. When we came into office in 1959, there were just a few million dollars in the kitty. Whatever we wanted to do, we raised taxes for. Now we have billions of dollars. Let's safely put it aside. In the argument, please do not assume that I will be the president. <laughs> I have made no commitment to be the president. It is a possibility which I will consider when the time comes. But even if I do take it up, I will not last forever. So when you pass this, you are passing it for anybody to be president. And that is the basis on which the cabinet has considered this matter for five years. Six years, really. Ong Pang Moon says five years. It's actually 82. Six years. I commend it to you. I think you, are, you can sleep better with your money under lock with two keys. It has been suggested that this way I will have control. That, in other words, I will still control the Prime Minister. There's two centers of power. You know, the constitution of the PAP and the way The Central Executive Committee is constituted. The mechanics of the system and the Constitution of Singapore. If you read that carefully, and Mr. Ong Pang Boon does know how the party was run because he was the organizing secretary for many years. He will know both the mechanics which are in the Constitution and the dynamics, which is in the interpersonal relations between the office holders, given me and my links with so many people, all I got to do is to stay Secretary General of the PAP. I don't have to be President. I stay Secretary General of the PAP and I can decide I will have a very strong last word on policy. I don't have to be the President. And I'm not looking for a job. Please believe me. I commend this because it is good for Singapore. To those who... I think Rajaratnam has been egging me to say this. Actually, <laughs> it's not... I didn't think it was worth my saying it. But he said, you better say so. You might as well disappoint them now. He says, That's, all this is really to get rid of me. See? Get me out of the way. 
I belong to that exclusive club of founder members of new countries. First, prime ministers or presidents of a new independent country. And even for my sick bed, even if you are going to lower me into the grave and I feel that something is going wrong, I'll get up. <laughs> Those who believe that when I have left the government as Prime Minister, that I've gone into permanent retirement, really should have their heads examined. <laughs> this business of key appointments, I have not included so many. My proposal to the Cabinet was the key jobs. PSC, Armed Services Council, MAS, GIC, and the ones with a lot of cash. They thought it over four years. They included a wider lot. Now, town councils. It's going to be a qualitative change in the nature of the candidates that you have to look for. It's a two-edged sword, this, and my younger colleagues know this. They have thought it over for a long time. I suggested to them twining to get our Malay candidates elected without too much of a problem as the competition becomes fiercer and fiercer. They thought it over, tossed it around, they came up with GRCs in three, and they married it into their scheme of town councils. I commend them, but it is double-edged. You get a serious-minded, com competent, able group. One election, they win just one GRC. They do well, the next election, they can have a clean sweep. That's what the PAP did. In 1955, we fielded four out of 25 candidates. We won three. By our performance in four years, in the next election, we won 43 out of 51. Because we also had the city council. We could show what we could do. But that's fair. If such a party gets in, performs well, wins the next time, Singapore is in no danger. But what worries me is one freak vote and a lot of a motley crew gets in with a single member majority and it's all washed down the drain. In one term, I want to run briefly through the kind of problems which town councils badly run can come into. I met the manager of the estates section. I said, tell me, what can go wrong? He says, all right. Conservancy and cleaning. Isun neighborhood 1 and 7 and Sambawang estate. In April this year, no, last year, sorry, the contractor did not do his, his work, supervision, was bad, his workers were not paid in time, workers did not clean up common corridors, rubbish not swept. In a few days, the rubbish chute had piled up to the second story. 57 blocks rubbish accumulated the second story. It was beginning to smell, maggots were beginning to form. So he 
got an emergency team from elsewhere and cleaned up. Four days to clean up what was not done properly for just two days. Because every day they got to pour new ones in. It gets complicated. My concluding note is a sober one. Yes, we have done well. Yes, there's a team in place to provide continuity. But I want to add a caveat. I don't want to be blamed if anything goes wrong. I've done my best, and I think this is the best in the circumstances. In 1980, after the elections in December, I had a session with uh, five of them. Ang Ting Chiang, Go Chok Tong, Dana Balan, Tony Tan, Lim Chion. And I gave them my frank opinion of what I thought of them as leaders. Watching the campaign, how they conducted themselves, how they operated. I rated them as follows. One, Tony Tan. Two, Go Chok Tong. Three, Ong Ting Chiang. Four, Lim Chion. I didn't list Dana Balan because I do not think Singapore is ready for an Indian. Prime Minister. And he's realistic enough to know that. No, no, but, but I wanted them to know my view so that they can decide on their views as they appraise one another. And I gave my reasons. I put Tony Tan number one because although Ko Chok Tong has got a faster mind and he has. He has a fast, quick brain. There's a decisive quality about him. He'd listen, take all points of view, and decide. After listening, you can't keep on listening. <laughs> After listening, you sit down and you listen to your conscience, your judgment, and you say, right, we will do this. And if it's wrong, I will take the responsibility. I told Go Chok Tong, look, you're trying to please too many people. Even the pressmen, they, they badger him. He keeps on obliging with answers. I said, just cut them off. Ong Teng Chiang, I consider a first-class chairman. He's equable, he's patient, he listens to all sides, he's very fair, and he's decisive. But he's educated in Chinese, he's not as quick in the English as would be convenient for a Prime Minister operating English in the working language. I'm frank, I'm candid. I tell them what I think. Lim Chion, I rated as number four because he, I told him, look people in the eye. Why do you look down? You, there must be eye contact. Whether I like you or I don't like you, I look you in the eye. <laughs> they took it well. But I said, you decide. 
After the 1984 elections, or even before the 1984 elections, I could see that Tony Tan was opting out. He did not want this job. <laughs> this is a remarkable team, you know, I tell you. They are not mad after power and glory. They want to do a good job, and they do not want to take on a job which they feel they can't commit themselves to heart and soul. And they are honorable men. So they decided amongst themselves, one, you go Chok Tong, two, to, uh, Ong Teng Chiang. Lim Chion, meanwhile, had a bit of trouble in the NTUC. I think I, to, I want to clear this. He upset certain persons in the NTUC. His style of working created misunderstandings. And of course, they went to see Devon Nye, who was then the president. And Devon investigated and got hold of me, and we went into it. And, well, it was difficult, so let's change. But he's an able man and a good man. So, <clears throat> after this election, he says, look, I'm in Kappel. He wants to do a good job in Kappel. Call it a day. I called him up twice. I said, look, think it over. How many people have got his ability and his experience? He's been in the cabinet. He's been secretary general of the NTUC. You throw that away and just look after Keppel? I think that's a crime. <laughs> Keppel can find somebody else, but... Singapore can't find another MP like that and you want people like that. Because in a crisis, <laughs> in a crisis, such people matter. What we've tried to do is to get as many good men as possible inside and committed to Singapore. Because it's the only way it can survive. Other countries, there's tradition. Such and such a group always have people in parliament. The trade unions produce their quota. The Labour Party has got certain universities, certain clubs that produce their left-wing radicals. The landed gentry and the city will produce their quota of MPs. And they are there to defend the country and their part of the country. Singapore has no such tradition. We are ourselves. We never existed. We are not even a community. We are trying to make this a community. It's an able, honorable lot of people. If you are the Marines, for every campaign that you fought in, you will have a streamer from one part of the flag, at the flag post. So, you have some flags so full of streamers that you can't see the flag. They have fought so many campaigns. This PAP New Guard colour has got only one streamer. It's got Singapore out of a recession, which is something. It shows competence. But it was a solution based, an economic solution based on the political foundations built by the old guard. The NTUC was there in place. The mechanism for getting things done in place. Slowly, gradually, they have to build on their own political foundations. The question is, on their own, a real political crisis, not an economic crisis. An economic crisis is not life and death. A political crisis 
can mean the end of everything. Have they got enough people with that fire in the belly and iron in the soul? Because when you are under pressure, the world changes. You know, it's like a TV screen. The picture, instead of being clear and crisp, becomes wavy. Under pressure, that's what happens. My original team of nine, under pressure, six stood up. I would rate them in this order. Go King Sui, Raja Ratnam, very close to each other. Ong Pang Boon. No. Ong Pang Boon, To Chin Chai, Ahmad Ibrahim. Yong Yuk Lin. They did not rattle. Yes, they were nervous. Yes, they know that this is big trouble. But the faculties are working. There's every determination to see the problem through. Come what may. If we are skin alive, so be it. A good team requires the leader and at least two others. Under heat, performance is high. I have a lot of time for S. Rajaratnam. Because the more you pressure him, the more you put the heat under him, the more his faculties function. And he <laughs> hammers away at his typewriter and fires back with gusto. And the communists can give you hell. And he gave them hell back. And it raised the, you know, it's like the band when you're going into battle. Your band collapses, no tune. Your soldiers get demoralized. So when your soldiers read a powerful repost, their spirits soar and they go canvassing more, harder, make more speeches. We won. Morale is three quarters the battle. All I can see, in, I've not seen the team under crisis. I've seen them under normal conditions. Minor pressures, yes. They got, there was some flack over this uh, re-arrest. But the flag was more directed at me, so I was like a light, lightning rod for them. They took the decision with my concurrence, and I'm happy to take the flag. That's all right. It's water off a duck's back. What I have to do, I will do. That's that, full stop. Let history decide. But my worry is this. There, I can only see two, I'm sure, who will not melt. And you need at least three. The Prime Minister and two others cannot melt under pressure. The Prime Minister alone is no good because the rest of him are wobbling. Uh, the team just, they go home, they have their cups of tea. They say, no, I think he's wrong, don't you? I think we ought to take the other course of action. Knees wobble, that's the end of it. Whereas after our meeting, six chaps go out and they buck everybody up. All the MPs stiffen. MPs get wobbly under pressure. And you've got to say, look, that's wrong. We will do this. We will survive. We will succeed. This is the right thing. That's how you get out of a crisis. I, I take this as a metaphor which you, you can find useful. Let's say, you know, there are two kinds of kiln, kilns. One kiln, you go up to about 500 cc, you bake an earthenware jug or a bowl. The other, you bake stoneware or porcelain, 1,000 cc. They have gone through 500 cc. How many will survive 1,000 cc? I just cannot know because you can't simulate that. You've got actually to go through it. All I can advise you is this is the best available and you pray and work with them. Remember this. 
Good ministers are not just those who kiss babies and smile <laughs> <coughs> and have dialogue sessions. You can have endless dialogue sessions. It's very good. You keep on listening and so on. It means at the end taking very tough, very unpleasant, very unpopular decisions and still smiling and still explaining. And finally, pointing out, see, we are turning the corner. The figures prove it. That's what government is about. You must be prepared to have bones broken and blood spilt. There are sometimes no way out. And you must never forget, you're not cheering a football team. You know? So if the team loses, you go home. You are cheering yourselves. If your team loses, that's kaput for you. If we had lost, you would not be here today. We sit down, we are ourselves, we've got reserves, we've got Hawkeye aircraft, we can fire fireworks, we can have a carnival, We've got jobs. We are moving from three-room flats to four-room flats. Expressways, tunnels underneath, underground. That is the sunshine after. But there were dark moments. Very dark moments when we, I, I could not be sure we would ever get out of that tunnel. One of those periods would be 1964, after the riots, till August 1965. <laughs> there was no way in which anybody could tell us that we would get out of it. But we knew we had to do what was right, namely stand by what we have agreed in the Constitution. And we did, regardless of cost. And because the people supported us, therefore we succeeded. It just wasn't guts on our part. It was guts on the part of a total population. A total population refused to be cowed. We gave them the courage. We drummed up the music, but the people stiffened their backs. And that's the way it has to be done. You want them to perform, please remember, it's not smiling and kissing babies and patting people on the back all the time. There are times when a very good, firm karate chop is necessary. And deliver it cleanly. Don't have two chops where one will do. <laughs> That's the reason why I have the minimum number of people suffering from karate chops. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. <laughs>